Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to our session. I know you had a choice at this time during our conference for which session you'd attend. So we're very grateful you've chosen to hear more about uh, our thoughts um, as an organization around a critical point that we all have to consider as we think about the future of tomorrow and how we uh, prepare for uh, an aging society, how we prepare all generations within uh, this really crucial uh, topic of housing. You know, housing is a challenge. We have heard for several years um, perspectives around um, issues with respect to the housing market, accessibility. So how, how do people in different generations get access to the right housing? Making sure that housing is adequate in terms of fulfilling the needs of people is a hugely important issue. And of course, with something as large as housing, the issue of affordability is one we can't uh, move away from. I think we've heard some really interesting perspectives throughout the conference so far on some of these critical issues that we must consider when thinking about uh, different generations and what an adequate future will be like for all of them. Um, if you think back just to some of the findings from uh, Sir Michael Marmot's presentation around the health inequalities and how some of those inequalities manifest, the fact that they are different, these health outcomes are different for different uh, socioeconomic groups and in different regions and locations, these really also factor into understanding the challenges around housing. So um, ILC has done quite a good amount of work over the years uh, on issues related to housing, in particular, looking at the specialist retirement housing question. I've done a lot of that work myself, looking at international examples of retirement villages, investigating questions on loneliness and social isolation within uh, these communities as they compare to uh, mainstream housing, finding some very positive outcomes, demonstrating the uh, value of this kind of housing. But we know, for example, with respect to specialist retirement housing, this is such a small proportion of housing for older people that we can't lose sight of the fact that mainstream housing is where we're going to see housing be delivered, how we need to improve on that, and how we need to improve accessibility to it. So we've got a great panel for you today to give us perspectives, essentially looking at it from three particularly important angles in the context of our generation's theme for the conference. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over to our first speaker, who is Jim Boyd. He's from the Equity Release Council, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about some of the his perspectives on these issues for housing as it relates to the older population. So Jim, over to you. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, I, I'm Jim Boyd. I'm Chief Executive of the Equity Release Council. Brian asked me, first of all, to uh, explain a little bit more about equity release because it's quite technical uh, and then obviously I'd like to explain why I don't think that equity release should be as a penalty uh, viewed as a penalty on on the young as it's sometimes framed so the first thing about equity release it refers to a range of products that let people over 55 access equity or the cash in tied up in their, their homes uh, they can either release this as a lump sum or in several small amounts or as a combination of both uh, this, the, the most popular form is something called a lifetime mortgage, where you take out a mortgage secured against your property and the loan amount and interest which is accrued can be paid back when you die or when you move into long term care. And you can choose to make repayments or let the interest roll up. Um, recently, in many years, this has become a vibrant market um, with a gr a, the growth of many product options and many to help consumers to pay down that interest and to make voluntary partial repayments without charge. Uh, the really important thing to stress is equity release is designed to be a long-term contract. It really isn't suitable for everyone. And that's why there's uh, such a long and structured advice process before you can uh, choose one of those products. A uh, tiny bit about the council, uh, we're the representative body for the sector. We're also a standard set, uh, setter. Uh, the key thing is that the FCA is our regulator, but we set further standards which go beyond um, demanding compliance by our members. And just very rapidly, um, the, these comprise valuable consumer safeguards. Um, for example, people who enter into 
actually these products can be satisfied that they have security of tenure, they can live in their houses um, until they go into care or until they die. They never owe more than they own. And we require independent uh, legal advice and uh, uh, family conversations. It's very important that everyone is gathered together. So anyway, that hopefully is put into context. And really the point I wanted to, to address really today was the fact that um, I'm very concerned that um, many seek to frame equity release um, as a penalty to the young, uh, because um, it's viewed very much because equity release enables uh, people in later life to live in their properties for longer, um, rather than downsizing, that um, that actually um, harms the young. Um, I think equity release and downsizing should not be viewed as mutually exclusive because many people who take out equity release have downsized already um, or, and then take out equity release and, and then vice versa. Um, it's also important to recognise that many people share their homes with multiple generations. And actually one of the drivers for equity release is people um, taking out equity to support their family to um, get a deposit of their own to move into their own homes. But I'm very concerned about it, any, any discussion which seems to pit um, generation against generation. Um, but having said that, we've got to recognise that many homeowners do want to live in their homes um, for as long as they can. And that actually increases uh, through later life. And they do want to live their lives independently, but also in the communities where they've grown up and they have memories. And I think that's a very legitimate uh, argument. But I don't think it's fair to say that penalises the young. And the, the arguments for that, I, I believe, are sort of quite clear in this space. For, for many, actually, it is a source of uh, cash for the young. It gives a greater access. Um, one in four loans uh, involves payments which are given in part to their families to either cover off debt, education, or the cost of divorce, or actually, as I mentioned before, to fund a deposit. And there's a recognition that as people leave long, uh, live ever longer lives, uh, in the past, um, there was a cascade of wealth through inheritance, which passed the younger at, uh, at an age when they really needed it. And now I'm so so delighted that people are living longer, longer lives. Uh, but it means that transfer of uh, wealth um, is now being deferred. And equity release now acts as a mechanism to support that for uh, those people who need that at the time when it's most important. Another key point is that um, equity release provides value to the economy and in this way uh, provides value to younger generations. Significant sums are spent on services and this feeds into the economy, and the funds and employment and of course the younger generations. The elderly don't just sit in cash, they spend it. This is great for our economy and if you consider that one third of equity release is taken out to support the building, adaptations to homes, that shows a significant flow through to those services and new technologies. Funding is also spent on quality of life, um, for travel, for leisure, for visits. And in this current environment, it's so obvious now that we need people, obviously when it's safe, to go out, to go to cafes, to eat, to support pubs and restaurants. And the elderly do this and it support, and then in this way they support uh, thriving uh, parts of our economy. They also use money for services, for additional care services for gardeners, um, for all those services which uh, really enhance their lives. But this is money which cascades through to our economies. And there was work recently from uh, ILC UK which demonstrated that in the future, the elderly are going to be the real generators of new sources of business, um, whether it's leisure or fashion. These are a very dynamic entrepreneurial cohort. I think two other areas which we have to address is that the elderly want to look after their own needs. They don't want to be dependent on uh, the state, on other generations. Um, it's just very much within their nature. Um, and when many people take out um, money from their property, they want to do that to support their independence. They want to pay off debt in cases. They don't want to fall back on means-tested benefits in the state. They don't want to be a burden or don't want to be perceived to be a burden. So, for example, when people take out uh, additional uh, income or, or capital as a supplement to their retirement savings, they don't want um, to be perceived to be a burden on their family or to make claims on them. So 
uh, again, the young are being supported hugely by this very responsible and very independent generation. And the last point, uh, looking ahead to the future and looking to inheritance in the broader sense, is I believe increasingly equity release will be used to grow the market, uh, a market in green equity release. And by that, I believe equity release products will be used to support and incentivize um, greater investment in the retrofitting of homes um, to um, invest into say the heating, insulation, uh, heat pumps. Um, not only will it make our older and our very aging housing stock, and we have actually amongst the oldest housing stock in Europe, uh, better to live with, a uh, better live in for older people, making it much warmer. Uh, they'll actually make a positive contribution, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, to the UK's need to meet its zero carbon objectives. Not only um, will this make um, these, these homes, these properties energy efficient, they'll meet key environmental targets. The built environment is responsible for 30% of all of our greenhouse emissions. So, I mean, I know that uh, certainly in, in, in this market, this sector, people are looking at incentives to support those behaviours. But I don't think I can think of a more fitting legacy for the elderly to share with the young than to leave uh, a greener and better environment for them to live in. So to, 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 to finalise um, this, this particular um, sort of series of arguments, um, please don't think that people exercising their choice to use the value in their properties to support themselves to live independent lives should be viewed as a penalty to the young because in many ways that, that sort of cascade of wealth which comes from it plays such an active role supporting their communities and supporting the young. And thank you, Brian. Great, thanks so much, Jim. That's you, you, you've raised some really important points um, as we knew that you would. Um, I certainly second uh, your, uh, one of the, the main points I think you're driving through is that we can't, we can't allow this uh, to foster these debates of pitting generation against generation. Um, what one lesson I think I've learned over the years of doing research um, with respect to intergenerational questions is that um, many of the divisions that often are perceived as generational uh, relate, when you get down to the detail, more to questions of sort of class and socioeconomic status or uh, deprivation. Um, and I think that is what we have to keep in mind as we uh, think about the future. Uh, related somewhat to that theme, um, I'll introduce our next speaker, which is um, Keje Okeowo. She's director of Huddle, which is an organization focused primarily on younger people um, and working quite closely with those who come from uh, lower socioeconomic backgrounds or who are less um, advantaged in position. So um, Keji, over to you, please. Thank you, Brian. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Keji. So as Brian said, I um, am director of Huddle Youth Development Agency, and we do primarily um, work with and on we work with and for young people from low socio and ethnic minority backgrounds. Um, we tend to focus on the issues that are most pressing for young people in regards to their personal and professional growth. So whilst we're not an organisation that directly supports young people in regards to housing, um, we have worked with a number of housing associations over the past 15 years to set up estate-based youth forums, which give residents, which give young residents an opportunity to be involved in the decision-making processes regarding their homes and where they live. Um, and this has been achieved through youth representatives um, to tenant resident association meetings, heads of service meetings and board meetings. Um, so in the lead up to this event, we've held a series of roundtable um, conversations with young people and, pro and, prof and professionals from across our network to hear their views and ideas on the needs of young people and the impact of COVID and, you know, and what's next in regards to housing. So um, many of the points that I am raising are very fresh um, and they are from um, young people ranging from um, 16 through to uh, 25, 27 years old. Um, so in regards to what the what are the current housing needs for young people now and in the future, um, there was a real sense from young people that there is a need for improvement in education and going back to basics. There is a lack of awareness as to what 
is needed in terms of ho- in terms of home ownership and what preparation um young people need to um what things young people need to prepare themselves for before they're even able to make um, those decisions and actually action um, their sort of steps into um, home ownership. Um, young people generally feel that um, they don't have enough knowledge or they don't have sufficient knowledge to be able to make the right decisions in regards to home ownership. Um, many young people um, felt that there needs to be more um, guidance in regards to the routes to home ownership and more information on things like right to buy um, and as well as information in regards to the pros and cons so that they can make more informed decisions. Um, when we were um, discussing with um, the groups of young people that we've, we've you know, we've, we've met with, a lot of them said that they have no idea about um, how mortgages work and that they don't have people within their close networks who understand that process either. Many of the young people we work with live in social housing. Their family have, their families have lived in social housing um, for, um, you know, for, kind of throughout their generations. And there aren't necessarily um, people within their, um, their families who have owned a home and therefore they don't have access to that information and and they don't know kind of like how to direct them as well. Um, Young people feel that right now there needs to be greater improvement in um, housing conditions beyond just kind of providing shelter um, and you know and heating (laughs) Um, and they feel that they um, they are generally living in places that are overcrowded, Um, there is a lack of space and that there isn't space available to them to actually, um, for them to grow. Um, And we've seen that kind of over during the course of this year, when we're working with young people virtually, we're seeing the knock on effect of of the um, kind of the living conditions. And we've seen the impact that it has on young people's confidence and their ability to um, participate in programs that will inevitably um, support them to grow both personally and um, professionally. Young people um, have also mentioned that they do not feel that there is an involvement um, of them as um, potential tenants and potential homeowners in the design of homes. Um, and they feel that this is um, part, this is feeding into why homes are being designed in a way that do not take um, internal and external spaces into consideration and the impact that that then has on um, a young person's um, well mental, mental health and their general um, well-being. Um, young people also feel that um, the provision of housing, of affordable housing, isn't isn't there and it isn't real. And for many of the ones, or many of the young people that we spoke to, um, London is absolutely unaffordable. Um, many of them feel that they have grown up in social housing and that the the prospect of kind of coming out of social housing and owning a, their own home is something that is far beyond them and then that also then leads to um the concern around um security um especially in regards to um tenure um so they feel that their parents have security around tenure but they don't and they they also feel that there is um not enough um information and not enough support in regards to um succession planning. Um, The young people who brought that up, many of them are young people whose parents have passed away. Um, They've lived in these homes all their lives and then they suddenly find out that actually they can't remain in their homes and then they don't know what's what the next step is and and um, you know where where are they going where are they going to live and who is going to support them. And um, whilst they they are they're aware about the rental market. They do feel like the rental market is unfair and that it is unregulated, um, and that landlords are a law unto themselves, um, and that there there is no one to kind of support them or to help them kind of um, argue their rights in regards to um, you know being in the being on the rental um, market. Um, there is also this sense amongst young people that there is a lot of pressure to buy property and that the um, 
that the kind of like the milestone of buying a home is a, a signifier of you achieving in life um, and you kind of securing um, your um, your financial stability in, in when you're older. So it's kind of like if you don't have that now, especially if you don't have it in like your 20s, that you're never going to you're never going to have it and you're never going to have um, financial security. And for um, there is a perception amongst um, young people that we've spoken to that if you're a young person who um, has predominantly lived in social housing, um, that there is there is no hand me down from parents, there is no inheritance, there is no support in terms of um, a deposit for a home, and then the idea of having to save, especially when you're on a low, um, when you're when you're in a low income household, it just kind of um, takes that 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 dream or, or that does that or that. Um, prospect of of owning a home it kind of makes it something that is so so distant and so far removed um and then that kind of festers um this feeling that the um that older people dominate the housing um the housing market um and that they um you know that they are living in homes that are quite large with a lot of space but they're not moving out they're not downsizing that's the perception that young people people have around that um, so in regards to COVID and what we've learned about young people in housing, um, there was a general sense that COVID has amplified the inequalities and gaps between young people from low, socio, low, so, low socioeconomic backgrounds and, from those, and those from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. It's amplified the fact that there is a lack of space and a feeling of confinement, that home is not a welcome space that it has therefore strained family relationships and it's made in it's it's kind of helped to um, perpetuate or not even just perpetuate but helped to really bring to light the fact that for many young people living in social housing that the ho homes are not designed with families well with the with the well-being of families in mind um, and then the impact of overcrowding on mental health is very significant um, and young people have um, generally feel that it was less visible for them before because they were at school and people were at work and everyone was going about their um, daily lives. But then having to kind of, you know, live under the, the, the lockdown restrictions have it really sort of amplified, you know, the fact that their home is not adequate for the number of people who live there um, and that there isn't space for them to kind of, it, it, there isn't space for them to get away. And then that then um, puts pressure on them to want to be outside to kind of want to um, not adhere to um, lockdown restrictions. And then that then leads to them feeling that they're villainized when actually the root cause is that there isn't adequate space at home. There isn't space to move and there isn't space to think. Um, there were a few young people who actually, who also said to us that there was a major conflict between um, their aspirations in terms of what they want for themselves and their families in regards to housing versus what the reality is. And the reality is, is that no one in their homes or, or, or across the generations in their families have owned a home. Um, they're not being paid um, well enough in order to, to save. There is um, a lack of understanding around shared ownership. Many of them said that shared ownership was evil, um, that even with their basic maths, they didn't, didn't quite understand like how that was meant to benefit them. And then that then that then leads to increased stress and worrying and not being able to see a clear um, a clear way forward. And also during this time of, of COVID and restrictions, there is a real sense of vulnerability of young people, um, especially um, vulnerability of young people who are renting, um, and especially young people who are student renters, um, who feel that there is no protection um, for them, there is no regulation of, of, of student um, lets. And interestingly enough, we had a young person who basically, who also said to us that there is a massive impact on um, young people's social mobility, um, you know, young people who live up north who might want to come to, um, who might want to study in London um, are having to really consider whether they can afford to live in London. And then that, and then that then has an impact on where they study and then what might happen in the long run for their, in terms of their careers, which then has another knock-on effect in terms of their earning power. So they really, um, the kind of the, the general sense was that actually what COVID has done is really shown the disparity between those who have and those who, who, who do not have. And the and then it also really amplified the fact that um, 
many young people feel that they're if they're not ever going to have the um, access to to income that will en enable them to kind of um, move out. Um, so then when we when we moved on to asking them about the future of housing and how they see that working, the top thing for young people and, and also the professionals in our network was that there needs to be greater consultation and engagement with young people. Young people need to be more involved in the design of homes um, and the resources and that are, are that are going to be placed within the communities. Um, you know, housing associations and property developers should be doing more to involve young people in um, their decisions, um, and also educating young people in regards to what actually goes into building homes, what resources are available, um, and what considerations are being um, what considerations are being made in regards to people's um, well-being. The next thing was around regulation of the rental market. Um, and there, and that there, there is a need for renting schemes for young people, um, and also um, financial management, pla financial planning um, for young people, especially young people who are living in social housing or are from um, low household incomes. Um, there was a suggestion as well that um, in regards to employers that they might need to be employer-led schemes which enable employees to sign up um, to um, something that allows them to kind of save sort of through their um, through their employer. Um, that was something that you know that seemed of, of, of a real interest because I think the general sense was that the kind of education or the, the 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 growing of awareness in regards to the process, process of home ownership is a responsibility for everyone and not just not just one particular kind of institution although um schools did did rank quite highly in terms of young people feeling that there isn't enough um in in the curriculum to prepare them for the realities of living in our society um they also felt that homes need to be um, designed with multi-generational living in mind, um, that more and more people are living, um, are staying home longer because they're trying to build their deposits or because they, they, they just can't, they just don't see a, a way for them to kind of move out. Um, and people are living with their grandparents and parents, children, etc. So they feel that homes need to be designed with that in mind, with the view that families will kind of grow. Um, so there's there's many things that there's many things that came from that and there's many more that I can touch on. But what I think I'll do is just kind of leave leave it there, and then hopefully through com through the questions I'll be able to sort of um, provide some case studies and some examples. Great, thanks, Katie. That's been really. I mean, there's so much there to unpack. Um, you know, you've really touched on a lot of issues that I think many of us are. Um, you know. In, on one hand, we can sort of understand intuitively that these are, you know, significantly important issues for young people because they're sort of at that earlier stage of adulthood. And so that mm -hmm. sort of formation of things arises. Um, you know, the, the question of one of the key elements I think here is, you know, you've tapped into sort of uh, with, with some of the people, some of the younger people you've engaged this question of not because of their family circumstances, not having those older generations to inform them about their mm. experiences because they've had different experiences, which leads to this overarching concept about intergenerational transfer of knowledge. So mm -hmm. um, with that, I'm going to move on to our final speaker, who's Stephen Burke, who uh, comes from United for All Ages, um, really working to create um, a Britain for All Ages, tackling issues such as um, loneliness, um, ageism, um, et cetera, um, to give us a little bit more of an in, in integrating these concepts into an intergenerational perspective. So Stephen, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. And good morning, everyone. I've been asked particularly to talk about intergenerational housing as uh, United for All Ages. Uh, we, we actually coordinate the intergenerational housing network in the UK. Of course, I can't ignore uh, COVID-19 and its impact on intergenerational work as I discuss the issue. But I think I ought to start off with, and first I should really state clearly that to inter achieve intergenerational fairness in housing, we need to build much more affordable housing, as we just heard from Keji. Um, we need to build at least 300,000 new affordable homes a year, and we're nowhere near that yet. Um, we also need fairer taxation of wealth accumulated mainly by older people through rising house prices. But we shouldn't also, I think, ignore the links in the housing market between um, specialist housing for older people and the availability of housing for younger people and families. If we were to increase 
the uh, housing options for older people, then we would free up more family sized housing for younger generations. So having said all of that, let me turn to intergenerational housing and why we are seeing its growth uh, in the UK. The, the response here to COVID has seen the growth of mutual aid and neighbourhood action. Uh, people locked down at home have volunteered to help neighbours who are shielding and, and have helped build uh, new community links. Uh, but sadly, much other intergenerational work has been put on hold as mixing has stopped or been restricted. Um, and the reality is we continue to face crises of loneliness and lack of affordable housing, which affect both younger and older people. And age segregation has worsened because of lockdown and the lack of contact and connection has multiple impacts, not just about loneliness, but also ageism, stereotyping, all, all contributing somewhat to uh, a bit of an intergenerational war. Um, but, you know, people want to see uh, substantial changes in the way they live their lives as a result of coronavirus, um, how we work, how we travel, how, how we interact in our neighbourhoods. And I think the good thing is that people want to see more intergenerational fairness. They want to see stronger community spirit and opportunities to interact with other generations close to where they actually live, close to home. So off the back of those positive desires, I actually predict that this decade will see uh, growth in five types of intergenerational housing with dis different generations living together, making better use both of existing housing, but also uh, seeing new developments as well. So the first, first trend, which we're already seeing, is that more families are choosing to live together with three or more generations living under the same roof, sharing space, sharing care, sharing finances, and much more. Um, and I think Kedji has already said that this, this is already happening out of both economic and social choices. It's great if you can find a suitable home big enough for both shared and private space. But for many, it's also about overcrowding and much housing simply isn't designed for multi-generational living. The second big trend is about uh, home sharing. More, more older people with spare bedrooms are home sharing with younger people in return for companionship and practical support. And uh, we're seeing about a 20% growth in home shares uh, annually at the moment in the UK. Uh, it's still patchy across the country and we need to see much more investment in home share. The third area using much better, better use of existing housing is where we're seeing some sheltered housing schemes for older people also accommodating younger people. For example, students or young mothers or young people leave, leaving care. And there have been some pilots in places like Haringey and Cambridge. Um, elsewhere, some extra care housing schemes for older people are also housing younger adults with additional needs, such in places like Hull and in, and in Peterborough. I think the biggest opportunity, though, we face uh, um, um, is around what's happening to our high streets and town centres, where obviously uh, we're seeing office space, retail space being emptied out. And some of that is potentially could be converted into both intergenerational shared spaces and intergenerational housing. And organisations like Power to Change are working with the Intergenerational Housing Network to try and make this happen. Uh, interestingly, Enfield Council recently ran a design competition uh, to see how to, they can make better use of, of some of those spaces in their community, in their town centre. And, and taking up uh, Kedge's point again, uh, they did involve younger people in, in, in some of that. This is something that every local authority should be looking at at the moment, how they convert their uh, deserted high streets, deserted town centres into uh, future living space for all ages. And then the fifth, fifth development going on at the moment is that there's a growing number of older people's retirement communities, particularly some of the newer developments, where they want to feature intergenerational activities and facilities in those developments. And, and that is directly in response to older residents' demands and wishes. So I think with the prospects of growth in all five of those areas, I, I actually predict that Britain will see a big growth in intergenerational housing in the coming decade, enabling older and younger people to live together, to mix through shared spaces and shared activities, and to develop meaningful relationships in, in stronger communities. Um, these mutual benefits will help build trust and understanding between, between generations, and they'll help tackle ageism, as well as reducing loneliness and providing more affordable housing. Thank you.
Great. Thanks. Thanks for that, Stephen. I mean, it's, it's always it's always wonderful when, you know, one of the speakers does a bit of your work for you and sort of laying out some of the critical um, uh, sort of, well, trends, to use your word, because that's really what, what it sort of leads to is understanding how uh, some of these trends and dynamics um, are going to play out or, or, or recognizing that they will play out and then reflecting on what we all can do to ensure that as it plays out, it's to the best to benefit of everyone. Um, I just want to say to everyone watching um, our session, we're going to go to a um, brief discussion session for uh, discussion for the rest of the um, breakout. Um, so do put your questions into the Q&A function that you uh, should see on your screen. Um, should be in that box to, if you've got your screen maximized, should be in the box to the right of the video feed that you're seeing. Um, but I think first I'll uh, sort of start this off by um, asking each of you um, to, to give us just a short reflection on a, a, a topic here that I think, you know, we, we can't in sort of with, with reflection on how the, co the experience of COVID and lockdown has occurred across the UK and, and, and in particular across England. You know, it's, it's highlighted this sort of classic north-south divide that has been mentioned in, um, in other spheres of, of uh, policy in the past. And uh, it really, I think, underscores as we start to think about housing, whether it's around see, the equity, access to home ownership at an early age or the development of specialist communities. The, the fact that, you know, the, the outcomes, the, the factors that shape the evolution of these things will vary from geography to geography. So, you know, we know that aging is taking place in the more rural areas as younger people tend to end up in more urban areas for jobs and university and things like that. So, I think I'll start with, with you, Jim, if I can just get some of your, perhaps your initial thought on how, you know, any of the work you do or the, the members with whom you work um, have thought about how to sort of, you know, do their best to ensure that sort of access to equity release and any of those topics is more equitable across geographies. Well, I, I mean, at the moment we, the first thing to say is that actually is an incredibly long considered choice. So we're not seeing anything specifically being driven now on a regional geographical basis. Um, what we've noticed is that um, all, all the drivers are there which are robust, and that is that there's significant consumer need. Um, you know, we, we, we live in an aging uh, population. I think if anything, we're going to see through COVID, um, maybe people approaching retirement a little bit earlier, earlier than they want to. And that obviously has an impact on whether people have been made able to make adequate um, ret retirement choices. Um, you know, sadly, I think there are going to be huge impacts on families with debt, the need for support uh, mm -hmm. for intergenerational living, um, room for people to, to, to live and sort of set up new businesses. And I think that might be another driver for people. I do think also we're seeing these huge trends being sort of really accelerated. And so I do think that against that background, obviously the government has uh, absolutely embraced uh, the need for the carbon zero requirements, recognizing that actually that trend is accelerating forward. So I think that's going to be a driver for growth as well. Um, so I, I just think what we're seeing is that sort of consumer need, if, if anything, is being amplified. Uh, and we're seeing these, these 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 trends accelerating. So that's the only thing I, I I think I can sort of say safely at this particular moment. Yeah, yeah, um, that's great. I mean, and, you know, I think I think that question of of sort of the ability for the sector, and in this I suppose in this respect, I'm talking more the broader housing market, the its ability to meet consumer needs. Um, Keji, I mean, one one of the the one of the key elements here coming back to this geographic question is the fact that of course people need housing and one of the things it sounds that you're that, that was highlighted a little bit in, in um, respect to some of the findings from the roundtables you did is this concept that some people are being pushed out of the neighborhoods that they grew up in and the fact that you know in an environment where we're trying to stimulate community cohesion social cohesion people are unable to you know have their needs met in the places that they want. Um, can you just reflect a little bit more on, on how that theme emerged in your talks? So um, where that came from was many young people felt that because 
London is unaffordable and that affordable housing isn't affordable <laughs> for the majority and that the only way for them to even consider the possibility of home ownership is that they would have to move you know away from London and and you know far out from London to areas that they are not familiar with which brings on its own um it brings on a variety of other kind of you know issues um and they just and young people felt that that is something that it's not fair um you know you've grown up somewhere you should have the option to um to live and to thrive um in that area and it should be your choice as to whether you kind of remain it remains somewhere or whether you move out but they feel like that choice has been taken away from has, has been taken away from them um essentially um they also they also felt that and actually something that came out which is which we were we, we we tried to probe a little bit more is they strongly felt that older people should be the ones that move out of london um mm -hmm. and again I, I apologize to those people who are not in london because this is very london centric in terms of the feedback but they felt that old people at a certain point should move out of london to allow young people the opportunity to have access to um the property market and to um allow young people to have access to um better paid jobs and that's that's an interesting theme i think you know um there's a from a, again sorry for everyone we're talking to going to take brief London focus, but you know there's been so much talk in the past around um, the London market, people moving to sort of the the, the outer, the home counties. Um, this has been potentially exacerbated by the experiences through COVID, whereby people have spent much more time in their home and are reflecting on what they want from their space, and so there are there's suggestions that the new trend is going to be people moving out from the centralized urban areas. Um, I mean, Stephen, you, you highlight one of the trends being around the changing high street. I mean, what are your reflections on the potential for these to address some of these um, points around consumer need and geographic location? Well, we've got to address these issues uh, urgently. Um, I mean, the as, as we've heard, COVID has exacerbated uh, inequalities, but it, you know, the housing market is one of the most unequal markets out there so uh, we need to address that covid has been fine relatively if you've got a house which has got lots of space has got a nice garden got space for an office good broadband etc etc um uh, unfortunately that's not the experience for a lot of people and uh, it's it's not just about your your living space either it's about the community where you live as well are there really good facilities locally is there space outdoor space that you can use uh, and so on so that's where we need to look at well, can we redesign our high streets, create not just homes and not just rabbit hutches, because uh, there's a real temptation that people are going to turn offices into uh, very, very simple dwellings. But we need shared spaces that people of all ages can actually use and can mix in and, and, and share activities as well. And that, that's the opportunity going forward. It's a question of whether councils together, together with uh, government can actually make the most of that opportunity. Uh, that that relates to one of the questions that's been asked by the audience and uh, go ahead jim yeah come in so i was just thinking that, that what, certainly one aspect which i think sort of ties into that and which we're incredibly sort of keen on uh, from you know the council's perspective is that we, we really now need to look in the round at actually those housing needs but also uh, obviously to look at better support for housing options for people in, in later life to, to downsize, to address some of the points, particularly on Keiji, Keiji made. Mm. You, know, um, you know, the more options that people have in later life, the more, um, you know, choice they have, the better outcomes, for, not only for the elderly, but for, for everyone. Um, you know, so we really want the government to look at better options to support downsizing, and actually also better urban planning, because uh, many people who want to move into smaller houses, but better planned houses, find that they're unaffordable. Mm. And that's just just no good for anybody because they want to have a time in, in the communities next to services, being able to work, to volunteer and actually work across all those generations. They want to be, you know, uh, with, with younger communities and, 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 and playing a role with them and supporting them, too. So that's something that we'd love. And we'd just love to see a little bit more joined up thinking across departments, mm. taking into account the age groups, uh, taking into account some sort of social financial issues and pressures. And, and, and maybe refocus government actually by having a minister specifically to look at, looking at the intergenerational aspects. 
that's a that's a that's a very interesting point. I know we as an organization have debated this question around um, how to stimulate uh, sort of more ministerial authority around the fact that within this broader understanding of aging and longevity, there is, needs to be a lot more joined up thinking, not only to join up the perspectives of different age groups, but these different um, themes and that, that, that fall under policymaking like housing or health, uh, et cetera. Um, we're coming to the end here and I wanna give each of you um, a, a minute or two each to sort of give your final reflections, uh, just to, to highlight some of the things that have come through in our um, uh, the Q&A from the audience. There are questions around whether or not this sort of shared space um, that we've seen, this is increase in shared spaces either through uh, you know, the, the, the lived experience or perhaps even within um, communities, whether that has an impact on questions of age segregation in the future, what that might look like. Um, there are questions around um, the impact of, uh, sort of impact of, of housing um, with respect to climate change and the fact that um, there's embedded carbon, for example, within new, new homes and how we can might be uh, addressing that. And then whether or not there are any um, international examples, for example, around um, equity release that you want to share. But th those are just sort of the, the themes of interest from our audience. Um, and so I'll give you each uh, just a minute or two to give your final thoughts, uh, starting with you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, uh, Brian. I you know, the, the fundamental issue here is that it is around age segregation and the fact that actually housing also leads to further age segregation. Older people, by and large, living in more rural or, t or areas or towns, younger people living in city centres, and, and that's and that's not going away. So we, we've got to look at different ways of bringing people to, together, um, and that could be through intergenerational housing schemes and, and high streets that I talked about. I would like to just follow up Jim's point. I mean, we... we have called for a department, a government department for connection, which brings together a lot of the issues that we're talking about throughout this conference, uh, whether it's connecting uh, to tackle issues around loneliness, uh, which we have a government minister for, but you know this is much wider than loneliness. Um, and, and we need to bring together the issues around housing, health, care, learning, uh, and so on. And that could be done through one single government department and, and supporting action at a local level as well. Thank you. Great, thanks. Keji, your, your final thoughts. Um, so I think I'm just going to impress upon um, the need for, for improved education in regards to um, home ownership and in, in regards to the, the roots in and also around um, upskilling and providing young people with um, adequate training um, in regards to sort of financial management, um, which then has a, uh, an impact on their ability to make um, good housing um, decisions and being able to make those decisions fairly early on um, and not kind of getting to a point where they realise, you know, they, they've come to a point where they're like, okay, now it's time I want to have a home, but actually there is so much that I could have done or I, or I needed to have known before this stage. And then you know, them then getting to that point where they then feel like they don't have many options when there are options out there, but they're just not very clear and they're not very they're not all necessarily always very equitable um, for all either. Jim, over to you. Yeah, um, I, I suppose it's just to restate that we need to have greater government policy to sort of look at downs downsizing and intergenerational housing issues. Um, to just say again that. You know, there's a for me a concern that people frame uh, the debate that equity release is in some way a penalty to the young because it stops downsizing. Um, I just don't think that's the case because um, the two aren't mutually exclusive, as I've said before. Um, and I just think that uh, for all the various reasons uh, that we've given about people uh, seeking to sort of support the communities they live in through releasing uh, equity from their homes, just please don't think that people exercising their choice to use the value in their homes who have built up the properties so they're living independently and fully is a penalty to young because they use that to support the young and to support the communities they want to live in. Great. Thanks so much. And thanks to all of you for all of your perspectives. They've been really, it's been a really engaging um, conversation for me and I hope for all of the attendees. Um, and just for all of you watching, you know, um, do take a look around the platform that we have. We've got about an, uh, an hour break for lunch. And so, you know, get, get fed, get happy. Um, and we'll see you all at 1.30.
Thanks so much. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.